By the spring of 1865, Virginia, once the mother state, lay demolished. Homes not in ashes had been heavily damaged, roads chewed apart, bridges down, barns and fences burned, crops ruined, livestock slaughtered. Such cities as Richmond and Abington and Lexington had perished in flames. Petersburg, Fredericksburg, Winchester had been reduced to rubble. The prior Shenandoah Valley was a wasteland. Northern Virginia looked like a desert. Virginia's economy and society and politics had been torn apart. The past was gone. The present was gone. Nothing remained but the broken dreams and the gravestones. And worse than all, more than 15,000 Virginian men were dead and three times that number had been injured during the war. The next generation would grow up surrounded by men with empty sleeves or sitting at dining tables with empty chairs. Meanwhile, more than a third of a million slaves were now free, but they had neither homes nor occupations and the land itself had been ravaged. It would take two years before the first tobacco crop could come in to help planters rebuild. And all the while, Virginians faced lawlessness, civil disorder, the challenges of future civil rights, and a vastly uncertain future. With little warning, a vengeful Congress in 1867 imposed military occupation upon the South. Five years of so-called Reconstruction were administered as punishment for being part of the Southern Confederacy. Then the program was abandoned. In the case of Virginia, little improvement took place, with the issue of racial equality left to dangle for another 100 years. Appomattox was not so much the end of the Civil War as it was the beginning of the United States as we know it today. And perhaps the man who did the most in helping Virginia rebuild itself and become a part of the nation again was ex-Confederate Robert E. Lee. To a group of malcontents, Lee once said, forget your animosities and make your sons Americans. Lee's example became an inspiration for the nation. The Civil War left a number of questions unanswered, but one that it did resolve forever was an end to slavery, an end to the ownership of human beings. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation led naturally to the 13th Amendment, and following that came the 14th and 15th Amendments, guaranteeing equal rights and the vote, at least to African American males. Those promises remained unfulfilled for generations until the 1960s, when the Civil Rights Movement, a natural descendant of the Civil War, finally realized the promise of emancipation. The deep love of country that we call patriotism came forward for the first time and in great waves during the Civil War. In previous years, few symbols of national unity existed. We had no national anthem. The American flag, the clearest and most obvious emblem of patriotism, was rarely seen. Flags flew at army posts and on naval vessels, but they were never visible on buildings, churches, or homes. Today, flags wave in every neighborhood of the land. And while our present national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, is difficult to sing, most Americans know and proudly sing the words to other patriotic songs. America, God Bless America, America the Beautiful, and the Battle Hymn of the Republic. The Civil War gave birth to so many things that are a part of everyday American life. In 1861, a Connecticut man made a giant improvement in safety and security when he invented a mechanism that required a special object to function. His name was Eli Yale, and what he invented was the Yale Tumbler Lock, by which we use a key to lock or unlock this mechanism, and keys have become a standard thing for all of us in opening doors and lockers and in operating automobiles and other machinery. You have to imagine what it must have been like to be a sailor inside an ironclad warship. And it had so many inventions inside that 
it would be impossible to list them all, but one that's particularly interesting is that the entire hull of the ship was virtually underwater. And the difficulty was, where do you go to the bathroom in a ship like this? So the monitor had the world's first flushable toilet on board a ship at sea because it had to be flushed from under the level of the water up and outside the ship again. And where else would it be? It was in the captain's cabin. Getting edible food to the armies over large distances presented quite a problem to the military authorities, and they would resort to a couple of new innovations in order to put edible food in the hands of their soldiers. One was canned goods. Canning had been around since the 1820s, and a number of things that people even today will still recognize were put in the hands of soldiers north and south, such as Van Camp's pork and beans, which began in 1861. Civil War soldiers also seasoned their food with Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire sauce, and a very popular item was Underwood's deviled ham. Items that fill our supermarket store shelves today were not entirely uncommon to the soldiers of the Civil War. Had you joined the Army in 1860, you would have been given one uniform, regardless of whether you were tall, short, wide, or thin. Soon, the U.S. Army began to resemble a convention of clowns. And it so upset Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs that he decreed that all uniform manufacturers would henceforth make not one uniform, but four. And they would call them small, medium, large, and extra large. And thus, pre-sized clothing was born. And now it's a worldwide custom. Had you bought a pair of shoes in 1860, you would have gone to the local hardware store and purchased a number seven, number nine, number 10, and the like. The shoes did not fit well. The soldiers quickly found that on the march their feet became blistered and bloodied and the efficiency of the army slowed down. Then some unknown shoemaker came up with an idea. Why don't I make a shoe that's contoured to fit the left foot and another shoe that's contoured to fit the right foot? And thus, pairs of shoes were born, a standard custom still in existence today. For the first 75 years of the nation's history, the income from customs duties was enough to finance the government. But the coming of the war placed enormous new strains on the finances of North and South alike, and there was no alternative but to resort to taxation. There were personal property taxes, real estate taxes, income taxes. There was even a corporate profits tax. In time, a national income tax was enacted in the Confederacy as well. But it hardly mattered because when Confederate citizens and Virginians alike came to their local courthouses to pay their taxes, they were paying it Confederate paper money that was almost worthless. In 1860, one went to the post office to collect mail. As the war years passed, more and more families received letters that a father, son, husband, brother was not coming home. And soon the local post office had become the community center for weeping and anguish. This became embarrassing to postal officials, and it was a Cleveland, Ohio postmaster who came up with an idea that the federal government quickly adopted. It is called home delivery of mail. So that mailbox beside your door or out on a post at the curbing is, in a sense, a memorial to dead Civil War soldiers. In the field of music, the first Civil War song appeared three days after the war began. Four years later, the war had inspired no fewer than 3,000 melodies. Eaton Goober Peas, Yankee Doodle Dandy, and the Yellow Rose of Texas were highly popular lighthearted tunes. Far outnumbering them were songs of loneliness and homesickness. When this cruel war is over, tenting tonight on the old campground, all Lang Syne, and home sweet home. Naturally, patriotic songs abounded on both sides with the Bonnie Blue Flag, the Battle Cry of Freedom, Dixie, and the Battle Hymn of the Republic being favorites. Our most familiar bugle call, Taps, was composed in 1862 as a good night call. Now it's used to say farewell at the burial of an American serviceman or servicewoman. Behind me is a simple brick home where Robert E. Lee spent his last years. Before the war, he and his wife Murray had occupied Arlington House, a palatial mansion overlooking the Potomac River and Washington. Union authorities seized the home during the war. 
and to ensure that Lees would never again inhabit it, they converted it into a soldier cemetery. And that is the rather sordid beginning of one of the most sacred places in our land, Arlington National Cemetery. Death is always a solemn occasion, but in mid 19th century America, the custom was for it to be observed in silence without the display of emotion. Yet when General Stonewall Jackson lay in state in the rotunda of the Virginia Capitol in Richmond, out of respect, more than 25,000 people filed past the coffin. Many of them carried blossoms and lay them on the casket as they passed. By the time it was done, the coffin was literally covered with flowers. And there are those who think that this is the origin of the American custom of sending flowers to a funeral. Battles and dead bodies came into American homes thanks to the new science of photography that appeared in the war years. Photographers such as Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner took still pictures of battlefields after the action ceased. Printers were able to transfer the photographs onto printing presses and mass produce the likenesses in news magazines. As a result, no longer was war something far away and far removed. Now one could sit at home and see up close the bodies of dead soldiers. The impact on emotions, as well as on morale, was staggering. The war brought such an interest in everyday activities that newspapers flourished and would continue to dominate American communications for the next 100 years. Owing to the success of the telegraph in wartime, it became the foundation of such later developments as television, faxes, and the computer age. In October 1862, the Congress created the Medal of Honor, the highest award this nation can bestow upon one of its fighting men or women. The Civil War was also the springboard for pensions to ex-soldiers, welfare agencies, and veterans' hospitals. Late in the war, the Congress determined that America should have some phrase, some statement, that would signify everything for which American ideals really stand. And thus, in 1864, was created our national motto, In God We Trust. Two of our national holidays have emerged from the Civil War. Memorial Day has become the one day of the year that we remember and honor all those soldiers who died so that the United States might live. And President Lincoln during 1863 and 1864, issued proclamations calling on all citizens to give thanks and praise for the bounties that our nation enjoys. Thus, Thanksgiving Day became a national holiday. A number of recognizable figures came out of the Civil War. The melancholy face of Abraham Lincoln, the calm, dignified face of Robert E. Lee, but probably the one most recognized around the world today was the face of a man who never lived. In 1862, Thomas Nast, a young illustrator working for Harper's Illustrated newspaper in New York, created a Christmas scene in which he had a roly-poly little figure who smoked a pipe with white fur around his cuffs, a white-rimmed hat on his head with a sprig of holly, and of course, he began Santa Claus. This was a uniquely American figure, not Europe's Kris Kringle or St. Nicholas, Santa Claus belonged exclusively to Americans. Of course, Virginians didn't get Santa Claus until after the war, but when peace came, so did Santa. And thereafter, Americans North and South alike could unite upon this one central figure of fun, of love, of charity, of happiness and Christmas. Another remembrance from the Civil War has eternal meaning. Scattered across Virginia and the nation are 100 or more soldier cemeteries. In them lie the remains of Johnny Rebs and Billy Yanks. It would do us all well to go into one of them sometimes and just listen to the silence. Listen intently and you may get a sense of kinship with men who sleep the last sleep because they loved America more than they loved life itself. Each stone in those cemeteries is the grave of a man who once lived and hoped, loved and lost. None of them ever knew a full life. 
for the nation they forged with their lives still breathes because of them. We must never forget the torch they passed to us. To do so would be to trample on the graves of heroes who bequeathed to us everything they had. There are not many cemeteries in this land where only Southern soldiers sleep the last sleep. But here in Spotsylvania is one of them. And the name you see most on the tombstone is unknown. The Civil War was a long time healing, but many of those ex-soldiers made peace with themselves and the enemy. Confederate General Joseph Johnston and Union General William Sherman had every reason to hate each other. For over two years, their armies campaigned against one another from Mississippi through the Carolinas. And yet after the war, they opened a correspondence, and that correspondence led to a growing friendship. In 1891, Sherman died. An aged, feeble Johnston made his way to New York City, and on a cold, icy February afternoon, he stood bareheaded over the casket of General Sherman. Sherman's daughter begged General Johnston to put his hat on lest he grow ill. Johnston replied, if he were standing here in my place, he would have his hat off to me. Six weeks later, General Joseph Johnston died. He died of pneumonia, which first began when he stood bareheaded on a sleet storm to say goodbye to a friend. Virginia has always stood proud among its sister states. It thinks of the present and plans for the future. But more so than most states, Virginia cherishes its past. To begin to forget the destructive storm of 1861 to 1865, Virginians had first to remember it and pay tribute to it. This the state has done in many ways, including preserved battlefields, stone memorials, roadside markers, a department of tourism, and historical societies in almost every city and county. The sacrifices of the Old Dominion in the Civil War are an undying part of our heritage. That four-year struggle was bloody and costly and destructive. Across the state today are fields blown bare by the winds of a tragic yesteryear. If we can seed again those fields with the bonds of affection and freedom and equality that should unite us all, then Virginia's darkest hour may possibly become its finest moments. <laughs>